Yes, um, my research looks at the complex and rather vexing area of ecological processes and social institutions. Uh, it is often referred to as social ecological systems thinking. And the idea here is the more we examine this area, the more we try and understand this area, the more we're able to possibly build a more resilient society, both ecologically and also socially. And my, uh, my research has uh, more or less focused on this for quite a long, long time. And it really be goes back to a long time ago when uh, maybe uh, when I was looking back in, in at it a few years ago, for about uh, two or three hundred years, we have separated human processes from from uh, from ecological processes. Humans have always saw themselves as separate to to nature, and in recent years, the debates and debates have been increasing about this this separation and this impact and this pressure and this is is incredibly intense changing of the environment around us. If you think about it this way. Uh, nature, and um, we saw these, these talks earlier on, nature and the environment has shaped species and evolutionary processes for forever. And it's only in the recent uh, couple of hundred years, or maybe even a thousand, but more or less a couple of hundred years, where one species, us, is starting to shape the environmental processes that also shapes the evolutionary processes. In other words, humans are taking the primacy in changing the environment that they live in. And we're taking it rather, rather uh, severely. And around 2000, a theory was put forward to try and encapsulate this in a particular area. And it gave it a name, and it's called the Anthropocene. And next year, in 2016, there will be the final debate among our geology colleagues as to whether we live in an era that is entirely created by us. And what they mean by that is, that there will be a geological presence for all eternity of our current uh, uh, impact on the planet. Um, so therefore, in a couple of million years' time, as if I was alive then, I'd be taking a bunch of geology students, it's not my discipline, but just pretend I did, uh, out on a field trip, and we'd be drilling down, and we'd be looking at these little strata as we go down through the rocks, and I'd say, well now, there you go there's that strata, that's the Anthropocene strata, and I'm scratching my chin, and that uh, everywhere you go on the planet, you will find that layer, that strata, that indicates that period of time, I don't know how thick or how thin it will be, that humans radically and irreversibly shaped the planet. And I say that, that's part of the theory. We have changed all the processes on the planet, the geological processes are more or less the same, we've changed the carbon cycle, the nitrogen cycle, the phosphorus cycle through agriculture, the water cycles, cycles of deposition and erosion, and the cycles of biodiversity and ecosystem processes. We have incre incredibly changed those to such an extent that they are radically different than they were before we started to find our legs and develop farming and develop civilization. So in the middle of this theory of the Anthropocene, which is quite a challenging theory, it's almost uh, as severe as, a, as the debates around whether Pluto is a planet or not. But this is a lot more serious because it relates to this planet, not some distant planet or dwarf planet. It is indeed a, a, a very complex and de uh, very, very strong. And I, I imagine that this will fill the copies on the newspapers and will fill TV programs for the next year, year and a half, more and more. Uh, it'll gain more and more exciting coverage, if geology could be exciting uh, on the news. <laughs> But what what, what's in this process, this process of the Anthropocene, is this area of another theory, it's the theory of novel ecosystems. And that's what I'd like to talk about a little bit now, uh, nowadays. Model, uh, novel ecosystems are essentially those ecosystems that have been so radically altered by humans, directly or indirectly, accidentally or on purpose, that they will never recover to, this, to the time, we can never restore them to the time they were there before. We can never get back to them at any particular state. We will never be able to recover the exact type of ecosystem that was there before we um, change it. They are novel ecosystems. They contain huge, diverse um, uh, system or, uh, uh, species that are brought in from all over the planet. And I'll give you an example of what I'm talking about here. They're mar largely found in areas where humans have gone in and had enormous impact, and they've changed the landscape completely. Like this is a, a, an open cast mine. 
This is a peat mine. You'll find it in Ireland. You'll find it all over the world, parts of Russia, South America, and, and in many, other, many countries. And here we have a large open cast mine, which is removing all the resource. It, you, could, you could think of it as a quarry. You could think of it as a coal mine. You could think of it as a nuclear testing site. Huge amount of damage has, has gone in there. They removed the entire soil, all the peat and the carbon that went with it, and that'll be it. Now, we go in there, we take the things away, and we leave it. We abandon. We tend to have a finite use for things, and we move on. But if, we, if you go to this particular site now, that was 10 years ago, that's what it looks like. We've done nothing there. We've planted nothing. We've changed nothing. We haven't, we've blocked a few drains, took away the plastic, took away the train tracks, and that's what's come back. And to your saying to me, so Mark, hang on a second, that's, that looks exactly like what it would have looked like prior to the peatland being uh, developed by, by parts of the peatland growing uh, after the last ice age. And yes, it's exactly like it was a couple of thousand years ago before the peatland came in. And should we leave it for a couple of more thousand years, it will continue into a peatland. And if you could imagine humans would ever, for one minute, leave anything alone for long enough for it to develop by itself. And this is the inherent part of novel ecosystems, that we are tinkering, we're constantly interfering with things, and we will never let things return to their normal or to their original trajectory. And you're saying to me, oh, well, this is, looks very natural. And I'm saying, well, of course, you've probably spotted the elephant in the room here. This moss, this green moss that's in the, in the foreground here, of course, you all recognize that as the moss that has come from the southern hemisphere. Um, this, this is a Campylobactus introflexus. And this is a, a moss that has come in from the southern hemisphere. And it is a very good pioneer species for our, for our peatlands. And it is a non-native species. If you go to the lake, and samples that were taken in the lake behind, you see it there in the corner. There are insects and other invertebrates that come from South America, that come from East Asia. In among these Phragmites reeds you see here, there are hundreds of different types of species of plants that would have normally grown in this area, but also plants that have escaped from garden centers, escaped from gar uh, people's gardens, that have come in, on the, in, in bird droppings from, uh, from, uh, from all over the place. So what appears to be a original type of ecosystem is in fact, in the strictest sense, not. It's a novel ecosystem. And we will never be able to recover and repair this because all around this novel ecosystem, you'll find villages, towns, and people walking their dogs, taking photographs, or as I often do, we take students in there to mess around. And uh, to mess around ecologically, I should say. <laughs> uh, make sure I get that on the record. <laughs> so the important thing here, though, is that the normal ecological processes continue, okay? And they always will continue. No matter what we do to this planet, no matter how much impact we have, ecological processes, the, the cycles and the dynamic cycles of ecology will always continue. But in this case, they're producing a new type of ecosystem. And a very crude mapping exercise was carried out by the restoration ecology people a couple of years ago, and they deem about 26 to 38% in around that area of the global land surface could be classified as a novel ecosystem. That's quite a lot, I suppose. And, but we have to face, face fact. There are no pristine ecosystems left. Everything has been altered from the lowest oceanic trench to two kilometers above us where there's a, there's a biodiversity and, a, and an ecosystem up there. Everything manifests some impact directly or indirectly of our existence. It is anthropogenic. We are living possibly, as the theory might go, in the Anthropocene. And the theory, uh, the, the disciplines of conservation biology and restoration ecology, which are themselves crisis disciplines, they're disciplines that came about out of a desire for scientists to do something about it and take our results, not just for exploring ecology, but also exploring it meaningful so that we could try and redress the balance and redress and fix the things we cause problems in. These disciplines, are uh, very much not enamored with the theory of, uh, of novel ecosystems for two very uh, distinct reasons. First of all, a novel ecosystem will return. Let's pretend this is a, a, an abandoned farm, an abandoned runway, an abandoned corner of some city. It could be an irradiated zone. It could be the demilitarized zone between North and South Korea, places where there's very few people at all, places where it's just abandoned. 
These areas are naturally revegetating and they're full of invasive species, they're full of uh, visiting, visiting species, migratory species, you name it. And nature abhors a vacuum and it fills it with lots of whatever it can find and you'll also find these places are very high in biodiversity in, in the short term anyway. We don't know much about them in the long term. And what's, what's, uh, what's the problem, what the vexing issue with novel ecosystems is, is that I could say, why bother? Why spend all this vast amount of human capital and energy going out and planting trees and trying to recover rainforests and coastal dunes and coral reefs and all these things? Why bother? Just leave it. Let it do its own thing. It'll come back for God's sake. You know, let's go and do something else with our money. <coughs> the ecologists will say, especially the restoration ecologists, how much knowledge capital will we lose if we just let all this go? We've developed a hugely successful system of restoring biodiversity in areas where it hasn't been as severely damaged as this. It hasn't been, they haven't removed all the soil, they haven't irradiated, they haven't filled it full of toxins and built housing estates or whatever it is. It's just basically a little bit of damage, we can fix that again. So the restoration ecologists are kind of annoyed about that, stamping their little feet and wagging their little fingers, saying, don't, no, no, don't, don't talk about novel ecosystems. But the more important uh, and the more risky area of the novel ecosystems theory comes where I could come up to you if I'm an industrialist and I'll say, you know that massive rainforest you have over there, uh, Minister, uh, we can cut that thing down, make you a fortune, boom, the, co the country will be booming and, uh, you know, our company's right to do that. You go, oh, crap, uh, Minister, well now, you know, these environmentalists, they'll be all over me, I'll never get elected again. You say, well, huh, when we're finished, it'll be a novel ecosystem. Novel means good, right? So that's a big problem because it means you can argue with the novel ecosystem theory and you can also argue in some respects with the Anthropocene theory that a business as usual approach is in fact good or actually beneficial. In fact, the best thing we could do to the environment would be to harvest the damn thing and something brand new will come up out of it. It'll be exciting and new. We don't know about it. So this is where the problem lies in novel ecosystems theory, because whilst on the face of it, it sounds like we're exploring a, 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 a new and engaging way of, of looking how social and, and ecological institutions interface, we're also holding it up as a threat to the existing efforts that are being made on a massive global scale for 100, 110 years maybe, to restore, to conserve, to reintroduce species and, and ecosystems around the planet. So why am I interested in this area? Well, that's a pretty dangerous thing. Certainly it's academic suicide for some people. Uh, but this is a very interesting area on two reasons. So first, first of all, for those of you who are interested in maybe studying ecology, we know nothing about novel ecosystems. We, very, we know very little about ecology in general. What we don't know about ecology would fill thousands and thousands of books. Very, very little do we know. We know nothing about the energies and flows that go through here. We know nothing about the trophic levels. In other words, you know nothing but the food chains that are in these ecosystems. So anybody who is looking at a career in discovering what it is about ecology that is exciting and so on, it's right here. These are novel ecosystems are almost on your doorstep. In fact, in many places, they're in the cities. They're abandoned areas, gardens that have been left for 200 or 20, 30 years, old bits of parks that are just too in inaccessible to get a lawnmower into. These are, about, these are all there and you can get there by public bus. There's no need for helicopters or trips to the, to the rainforest and so on or deep oceanic exploration. They're right there and we know very little about them. So that makes it very, very exciting. But what makes it even more exciting and makes it more interesting from my point of view is the fact that these ecosystems, these novel ecosystems, are right here among us and we interact with them on a daily basis. We visit them, we walk the dog, we paint, we take photographs, etc., etc. We row, we do fishing and so on. We interact with them. And remember I said at the start what interests me most. What interests me is this separation between society, the separation between humans and nature. Well, what I think and what I believe will probably happen in the, in the coming years is the more we start interacting with these ecosystems, the more likely it is that we will be able to recognize what is what is truly a wild system. We have lost touch with wilderness. We've lost touch with what wild actually means. It is very difficult for most of us financially to get to a location on this planet and experience true abandoned and, and true unmanaged wilderness. Ta-da, it's right here in County Offaly. 
right, that's right, right there behind me. It's right here in your city centre. And in loads of locations throughout the world, there are novel ecosystems just sitting there with people interacting with them. And they're probably, it's probably, in fact, good, uh, a truism that a novel ecosystem is the first ecosystem you've ever seen as a child. The first thing you experience, you're a back garden or an area that is a little bit, wild, your first experience of wilderness is probably uh, a novel ecosystem. So let's explore these things because it's in these areas, it's in these novel ecosystems that I believe that we will be able to see a, a return of people to wilding or to, to visit or to rewild themselves. In other words, that we will be able to experience a, an abandoned and a, and a wilderness area right here in, in, in a very easily accessible location. So in this particular year or two years where we're talking about the Anthropocene, there's going to be a significant amount of, of press and, and, and doom and gloom because, oh my God, what have we done to this planet? It's now present in the geological time period. We'll actually be able to see it for all. Like future aliens can come down and go, ooh, that was our most embarrassing time. It's there in the rocks. We can never get rid of it. It'll always be there. But within this, this debate and within the debate of novel ecosystems, we have to recognize that there is also a huge opportunity for society to redress and to recover a part of itself that's been lost over the last couple of hundred years that it's separated itself from nature. And I think that it is a supreme irony, if this is true, and this will be a very interesting study, this is a supreme irony that the very areas that we damage and the very areas we damage the most could even be the locations that bring us closest to nature again. Thank you.